Hello and welcome to Divine Downloads. I'm your host, Cassandra Bodzak, and today's episode is one of my with my one of my beautiful, talented friends, Melissa Ambrosini. And we're gonna talk about her latest book, Comparisonitis, and how to stop comparing yourself to others, an epidemic right now that's stealing our joy and quite frankly, you know, messing up our manifestation process. So stay tuned. But before we get going, I want to make sure that you don't miss out on a very special opportunity right now. I am hosting a free Divinely Design Your Life Masterclass. So if you've been listening to the podcast, if you follow me, if you're like, this is the time, I'm ready, I want to head into this next year, really being the conscious co-creator of my life, I want to have that support, that community, that guidance, I want to get some tips, um, I highly recommend you click the link below, sign up for the free Divinely Design Your Life Masterclass. I'm going to open up my playbook, show you some of my most powerful tools and tips and spiritual wisdom, of course, and we will do a powerful meditative journey. We're going to lock it all in and we're going to, you know, ground it on that vibrational level. So check out the link below and I hope to see you there. And now without further ado, let's chat with Melissa. So I am so excited to have my beautiful friend and fellow author, Melissa Ambrosini, on the podcast today. And I am just bursting at the seams to talk about her latest book, Comparisonitis, with, yay, look how, first of all, this is just such a gorgeous book cover. And (laughs) I I just love this picture of you on it because I feel like it exudes, like you just have this like beautiful, like glowing joy essence and um and I love that you're talking about this topic because I think it's it's a contagious disease that all of us have right now um so why don't we just start off with there where did your inspiration maybe a little bit of your background and I think most of you guys listening may have already known Melissa. She is another beautiful light in the spiritual development world. And um, yeah, why comparisonitis and what was like, I have to write this book right now? Mm, mm, Great question. So there was a few catalysts that propelled me forward in writing this book. One of the biggest ones was, and I share this story at the start of the book, for those that have read it, um, for those that haven't read it, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share a story already from the book. Um, but basically, I was sitting on the and, toilet. And P.S., I love this because I was reading this book as I was pretty much in a similar space with my current book launch. <laughs> Okay, go continue. I just want to get that caveat. (laughs) Yeah, I, I love that. I love that. And we'll talk more about that. But I was sitting on the toilet, scrolling social media, comparing myself to a New York Times bestselling author who had just hit the list again. And I was feeling really crap about myself. Why aren't my books New York Times bestsellers? And all my books have been bestsellers, which I'm so grateful for. But why aren't they New York Times bestsellers? And I was spiraling into this very unhealthy, toxic comparison with this stranger that I'd never met before. I sat there for 20 minutes feeling really crappy about myself, got up, came upstairs to my office, sat down at my desk and got an email from a beautiful girl called Kathy who sent me this long email saying how much my work has inspired her, how much my books have changed her life, my podcast has changed her life, my meditations she does every day, my programs. We'd actually met in person at one of my live events a few years ago, which she reminded me of. And she said, Melissa, you've inspired me so much. I want to write my first book but I can't stop comparing myself to you. Um, And I was just like, you know, that emoji, (laughs) face plant emoji. Like, why are we doing this? Why? Because my response to her was, go for it, babe. You're amazing. The world needs to hear your message. You've got so much magic inside you. It's time to let it out. Go and write that book. And I just had this face plant moment where I thought, holy moly, here I am comparing myself to someone. And at the exact same time, she was comparing herself to me. And it's just 
something that is so common in our world today, and I think more so than ever because of the internet and social media, and I love the internet and I love social media. However, they have, they are a breeding ground for comparisonitis. And if we are not conscious and aware of it, we can spiral down into that very unhealthy, toxic comparisonitis. And so that's why I wanted to write the book because I wanted to help people just like Kathy, who had been sitting there comparing herself. I also share, I also wanted to share my struggles with comparisonitis and I wanted to help people at the time of writing this book. Well, at the time of that realization, I was actually writing another book with my husband and we were just about finished. We had a book deal, a signed book deal. We were 80,000 words in and I said to him, that's not the next book. I said, I've got to write comparisonitis. This is the next book. And I went to my publishers and I said, please don't hate me. (laughs) Right. (laughs) But, but I can't write this book next. And we had a signed book deal. I can't write this book next. The book that is bursting to come out of me right now is Comparisonitis. And I have such a long, beautiful relationship with my my publishers, you know, three books in. And they said, Melissa, we trust you. We love you. We know that um, your audience uh, is ready for this book. So go for it. So they let me write this book, um, which I'm so grateful for, and birthed that book uh, this year, which is very exciting. So I also, you know, another reason why I wanted to write this book was because at the time I was also um, working on consciously conceiving with my husband and it didn't happen the first go, which I thought it totally would I was like yeah I'm healthy I'm young Uh, it'll happen first go and it didn't happen first go and I was spiraling into a very unhealthy comparisonitis with my fertility journey and calling in our spirit baby and consciously conceiving and at the time of writing this book so before writing it and then during the the process and I feel like every time you write a book for me anyway every time I write a book the universe is like okay Melissa you want to be an expert on this topic we're going to put you through the fire and you have to work on what you're talking about like when I was writing Mastering Your Mean Girl they were like right we're going to bring up your mean girl in every area when I was writing Open Wide they were like right we're going to test your relationship to the nth degree and then right you want to write comparisonitis we are going to put you through the fire with comparing yourself I second all of this as well for all of my books it's an initiation it's an initiation (laughs) exactly the universe is like okay babe you want to be an expert on this I'm going to put you through the fire and uh so that happened and then also you know when I was doing research on comparison Uh, and the effects that this was having on our mental health, I discovered that, you know, comparing can lead to anxiety, depression, panic attacks, and also suicidal thoughts and suicide. And a couple of years ago, uh, one of my girlfriends took her own life and it was so challenging and she really struggled with comparison she was I've got full goosebumps she was the most beautiful girl like inside and out she was stunning she was kind she was so intelligent she had everything going for her everything yet in the middle of high school so around that 15 age she got very badly bullied And she started comparing herself to other girls and she really struggled with that for a long, long time. And to the point where, um, you know, it got too much for her, unfortunately. And so that's another reason why I wanted to write this book. And I have a daughter now and I don't want her to compare herself. You know, I look at her and she is pure, unconditional love. She is just a miracle. And I think, what if she started saying to me, mommy, 
you know, that girl is prettier than me or that I just would be, you know, like, no, I don't want anyone to experience that. And so this is why I had to write the book. We need strategies. We need strategies so that we can help ourselves heal from comparison and then help our children. Because how on earth are we supposed to raise children in today's age with social media and phones glued to their hand from, you know, when they come out the womb, basically, you know, babies have their own Instagram accounts uh, or their own hashtags these days. And we need tools. We need tools to be able to help ourselves and to help our children navigate this technological world that we now live in. So there are a couple of the reasons why I wanted to write this book. Well, I completely agree with you. I think that that is so important. And I'm so glad that you also brought up how much of an impact it has on our mental health. Because I think a lot of people write it off, not like comparing themselves like, oh, of course, I compare myself to some people on Instagram, as it's like a kind of like frivolous, whatever thing we do that doesn't have that much of a consequence. But I have really found that it has the most biggest consequences of our life. Because just like you mentioned, one of the number one things, I feel like it's the killer of dreams. It is the literal killer of dreams, where I have even myself sometimes, if I get into too much of the scrolling, will literally be like, even with all I've done and how far I've come, we'll see these other people that are always going to, there's um, have done more or gotten more than you or whatever. And there's part of you that just wants to give up. That's just like, that's actually not inspired by it. And then of course our, as you would say, our inner mean girl can sometimes pipe up and be like, well, if you were strong enough or good enough, then you'd be inspired by them and you wouldn't be triggered by them or you wouldn't be when in reality, we have to start thinking of this as mental health care and no, there's nothing wrong with you for looking at those other people and, and having that give you anxiety or feel pressure or uninspire you or making you feel funky. There's nothing wrong with you. And you get to do something about it. You get to like release anything in your life that's making you feel that way because it's not worth it. And just like you said, with your with your friend, you know, who tragically passed and, and I, you know, there was a, a few in, in the States here, there was a, a wellness influencer who very publicly um, took her life because of a bunch of people bullying her on YouTube this year. And, you know, we don't realize how much these tools, this technology affects our mental health. And so on all levels, if you're experiencing anxiety, if you're feeling that level, that like feeling of like, well, why even start the business? Because everyone else, everyone's already a coach or everyone's already written a book or everyone's already selling essential oils or everyone already has an Etsy shop or, you know, and you're like, well, I better just not do it because everyone's already better than me. Right. And we don't even give our soul like a chance to go after that. And I love in your book, how you talk about all these different categories. So I want to dive into some strategies in different categories. So I think we hit on the, the career one we can hit on first. Um, you brought up about your fertility journey. I think that's a massive one for women. Um, so I'd really love to talk about that and the things that helped you with that. And then in the book, you also talk a lot about your body comparison journey, which I think also affects all of us as women. So let's start with career. And what are the, the tools or maybe some quick tips you could give someone that's really feeling like everyone's already more successful than me? You know, what am I doing that they're not to kind of help them snap out of it and put the blinders on, <laughs> stay in their mm -hmm. own lane? <laughs> well, you just said two of the tips, which is put your blinders on and stay in your own lane. <laughs> and that, that goes for every area whether, you know, there's four main areas that we compare career and finances, like you said, uh, body image, um, relationships mm. and parenting, P 
parenting, Ooh, babies, yeah. fertility. My kid's not as smart as your kid. Your kid's smart, you know, that sort of thing. So let's touch on all those, but let's start with career because that is a big one. It's a really big one. And just before we dive into it, you have to think as well and remember that before we had the internet and before we had social media, we would interact with maybe like you would go to school and you would maybe compare yourself maybe to like one or two girls and then you go home and you're in your home environment but you're at school now and then you go home and then you've got more people online to compare yourself to it's never ending and so we need this we need the tools and we need the strategies so um when it comes to career the best thing that you can do besides putting on your little blinders and staying in your own lane is using the comparison as fuel to propel you forward. Now, what I mean by that is what you see in that other person you have within you. So if you see the New York Times bestseller, you have that within you. You have the ability the capacity to write best-selling books. So what you see in someone else you have within you, you wouldn't be able to see it if you didn't have it within you. So that's the first thing to remember. Then what I do is see what that person is doing or achieving or creating and turn it into inspiration and motivation. So what is it that they're doing? Right. Okay. They're writing New York Times best-selling books. Well, I can write best-selling books. Of course, I can write a New York Times bestseller. I've got to just do the work and, and put in um, the time. And so turn it from comparison to inspiration and motivation, whatever field you're in. So next time you're scrolling and you are triggered with comparison for someone in your field, maybe that's doing something in the career that you're in as well, and you feel this pang in your stomach I want you to flip it and remind yourself that what you see in them you have within you and use it to propel you forward that is literally how I wrote my first book I saw all of these other authors and I thought well if they can do it I can do it that is literally how I wrote my first book if she can do it I can do it she's just like me she's just like me so if she can do it I can do it and that's a really powerful thing to also look for the commonalities, right? Look for the commonalities there. And oftentimes that takes even diving a little bit deeper, right? So someone maybe even comes across mine or your Instagram page and from one they catch us on our like happy day with the book or something, right? Take a moment, maybe look up that their story, look up a podcast where they share their journey or even the bio on their website, right? And oftentimes you find that we were just like you and we had no special thing and we just, you know, we, we figured it out ourselves. And you, then that person now becomes, you know, a role model of sorts for you, right? And you can use that as like an example. One of the things that I think goes along with this that I used to tell some of my clients when this would come up in a, a a client session is I would say, what if Instagram is like the universe's catalog and you get to like, just order, right? So you see like, oh my God, like look at Melissa and her beautiful baby and her wonderful home or whatever. I want one of those. I love the vibe there. Like I'm going to take one of that. Thank you. Right. I love that book. I'm going to take one of that. Thank you. And we approach it from that joy of like, this is just showing me what's possible out there. All these beautiful people are showing me what's possible. And, and maybe I see something and I'm like, oh, that person is traveling all the time. And I'm like, I don't really resonate with that. Good for them, but I don't resonate with that. Good. You know, I don't, not going to choose that catalog. Right. But rock on, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and we get to, to play with it in that, that kind of different mindset. So I love that you can alchemize the energy around it. Babe, I love that so much. I love, I've never thought of it like that, looking at it like a catalog. I've never thought of it. And it truly is because you are co-creating with the universe moment to moment. So scroll your Instagram and instead of spiraling into toxic comparisonitis, go, okay, cool. Yeah, I'll have one of those. I'll have one of those. I'll have one of those. What an amazing 
flip. Hey, what an amazing flip. You're just shopping. You're just shopping. <laughs> exactly. I love that. Oh my gosh, that's brilliant. And, you know, that mentality of uh, using what you see in the other person as inspiration and motivation, it doesn't just apply to your career. It applies to your health and your body as well. You know, you see someone running marathons or being able to like, do crazy wild things with their legs in yoga, like use it as inspiration. And same with uh, relationships. If you are currently single and you follow lots of people in beautiful relationships online and you think, oh, I want to, I want to find my soulmate. I want that soul connection. Then use it as inspiration and go diving deep like what is it within you like what is what is it exactly that you want it's it's in there and it's about really getting clear on what it is that you want and then going going after it, taking that inspired action and doing some of the things that you and I spoke about on our episode together on my show about manifesting your dream life or whatever it is that you want exactly right because then it's discerning your divine desire and remembering that just like you said, when you see the New York Times bestselling author, you that wouldn't have such a resonance with you, good, bad, and different resonance, but resonance with you if it wasn't a divine desire of yours, right? Mm -hmm. And our desires aren't random. And so we can trust that, that sometimes when something feels a little funky when we see it, it can simply be because we feel very far away from that desire, right? But there does it that doesn't change that there's the yearning there, right? And that we can trust the yearning. Um, the yearning is actually a beautiful thing. And it's a little like flag from our soul that's like, oh, I think you want to order this thing. <laughs> this way. Come over here. Come over this Check way. This out. Check this person out. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's the more that we can get clear on what it is that we want, the more we can call those things in and remove the blocks that are in the way of having those things, whatever area it is, it is in our life. So, and especially with like my fertility journey and consciously calling in our beautiful baby, it was one of the hardest things I've had to move through. And watching my best friends get pregnant first time round. And here I am going at it again the next month and the next month and the next month and the next month and really having to dig deep and do, you know, there was, I did the test. There was nothing physically blocking me. It was all spiritual. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Which it in was, some way might've been some form of torture as well. <laughs> I totally, I was like, I almost was like, tell me, is there like a vitamin something going on? So like, I can take is, a supplement. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, is there anything that I can do? They were like, there's nothing, you know, it'll happen, Melissa. Just don't stress about it. You know, just don't. And I'm like, okay. Easy to say. <laughs> okay. But you know, it was a huge spiritual assignment for me. I had to go so deep within. I had to really dig deep. I had to surrender, trust, let go remove these spiritual blocks, these control blocks that I had in my way and stop comparing myself to everyone else around me. And it wasn't until that happened that then she came. What do you think? Was there a moment or a certain thing that was a catalyst to that, that final like shift of surrender? it was a deep knowing within myself that I was the one blocking. Mm. I was the one blocking. It was because I was holding on so tight, you know, that white knuckle grip I was holding on. I was trying to control. I wanted it to happen in my time. There was a lot of anger as well and frustration. I wanted it to happen in my time and it wasn't. And it wasn't until I completely surrendered I melted into trust like I really came back to trust let go of control surrendered and then it happened 
I think that's so powerful because one of the things I, I think I say this in the book, we might have mentioned this on your podcast as well. I love how overlapping these two topics are because I really believe that just like we said, when you have a desire in your heart, you wanted to be a mom, you knew you, that was like something that you were called to do, right? And it's not happening. It's actually in a way frustrating, yes, but also a relief to know that we're the one that's blocking it, right? That if we have that desire and it's so powerful and you want it so bad, it is of course meant for you, right? And so so then whatever that work is, and I'm not gonna like pretend that that's like, you know, fun or anybody enjoys, you know, being in that, that in-between space, but I think there is a level of peace you can find from being like, like you said, it's like, fully accepting, oh, I'm the only thing getting in the way of this. So how can I get the F out of the whole way right now? So I want to ask you about this because I also think this is huge, um, especially as it relates to female friendships. It is a really hard and it's a tender thing on both sides. So um, while I'm not in that space yet, personally myself, I have a bunch of girlfriends in that space right now. And you know, everybody kind of trying and some people popping off right from the get go and other people not popping off as fast and, and the navigating of the communication around that as to not hurt people's feelings and to how did you being someone that's, you know, so intentional and, and so aware, navigate protecting, you know, honoring and, and holding space for your heart and, and your tenderness around it while also holding that space for your friends during those conversations. Because this, I want to just say, this applies to not only this, but it applies to when you have friends that are, you know, me and Melissa, we have a, we have a couple of mutual overlap of girlfriends and stuff. And all of us are writing books and have podcasts and do stuff. And of course, we're like always celebrating each other. And similar, like when someone gets married or has a baby, you're always celebrating. But when it's something that you might be in that like tight manifestation portal of, there can be that moment of feeling like I'm just, I am genuinely happy for you. And also it's making me a little sad right now. <laughs> Totally. And, and same with like, you know, if you, if your friends are getting a promotion or got the job that you wanted to get or the partner or, you know, and you're single and you wanted to call in the partner or whatever it is, this applies to every area of your yeah. life. So I have an, a technique, a four-step technique, which I want to share with you. It's called the ACEs technique. And it's an acronym. ACEs stands, um, I'll, I'll tell you what it stands for in a minute, but this fourth step, basically why I called it the ACEs technique is because when you are comparing yourself, you feel the opposite to ACE. You feel not very good within yourself, right? But the ACEs technique helps pull you out of comparison and helps you feel ACE again, which is what we all want. I love it. <laughs> yeah. So um, the first step, A, stands for awareness. We have to become aware of where we're comparing, what we're comparing about. Awareness is the key for all inner transformation. It's the first place, right? So if you don't know why you feel funky when you scroll Instagram, like what is it? Is it because you are constantly comparing yourself to everyone else who's getting married? Is it because uh, your cousin who comes over and talks about her um, latest promotion? What is it? Like what is triggering you to compare yourself become aware even write it down you know whenever I go on social media I, I constantly compare myself to everyone else in loving relationships okay so become aware of it that's the first step because once you've shone light on something it's no longer dark you can now see it and you can transform it which is a great thing so that's the first step the second step is choosing a different path so when you would normally go down this path and compare and feel really down about yourself, I want you to go down a different path. And that path is the one we spoke about before as using it as inspiration and motivation. You've got one or one of two paths, the toxic unhealthy path. Why me? I'm not good enough. This will never happen to me. Or you can flip it and go the other direction and go down the path of okay, what is it that they have that I truly desire within myself? So using it as inspiration and motivation. So it's the second step, choose a different path. That's the C. 
Um, the third step, E, stands for eliminate the trigger or exit or exhale. And let me explain these things. So eliminate the trigger. When we are in the thick of like a really toxic comparison, one of the best things that you can do is just remove yourself from that situation. Get off social media. Maybe don't go and, and see that friend who is the big trigger for you. Um, just for a minute, this isn't about spiritually bypassing. This is this is simply just to help you heal, okay? Uh, and then you can go back to the social media or you can go and hang out with that person. But when you're in the thick of it, one of the best things that you can do is just eliminate that trigger for the time being. It, think of it like a wound. If you just keep picking at the scab, it's going to keep bleeding, right? You need to let it heal. You need to give it space. You need to give it time. You need to give it love and energy and maybe put a Band-Aid on it or a plaster or whatever you call them. And you just need to allow it space and time to heal. So eliminate that trigger. If you can't eliminate um, maybe exiting the situation. So say you're around a table and all your girlfriends are talking about how they've just had babies or um, their, their latest dates and their, their boyfriends and you've just been dumped or you've gone through your 10th round of IVF. Um, if it's really triggering for you, you can get up and go to the bathroom and take a few deep breaths. That's okay. You're allowed to do that. Or um, the last one, exhale. If you can't eliminate and you can't exit, uh, and I share this story in the book, you simply just exhale. And that's what I had to do when my best friend told me she was pregnant. And we were both trying at the exact same time and we'd planned it. You know, we'd planned to go at the same time. And the first time, um, the first month, uh, we, we, neither of us did the second month she did and I didn't. And I was devastated and I couldn't eliminate. I can't just eliminate. I'm sitting in front of her. I can't exit cause it's just me and her. <laughs> and so I just took a really deep breath. I came back to my center and I expressed to her how happy and excited this time is for her. And I also expressed that I, if I felt sad for myself too. I felt, you know, because it's something that I really want. And she, you know, she acknowledged that. And she said, I know it must be really hard. And, um, but I said, there is a part of me that is so happy for you and so excited for you. And I cannot wait to meet your little angel. And there's a little part of me that's sad too. Um, but that's got nothing to do with you, you know, and, just explaining that. So the third step E stands for eliminate, exit, or exhale. And then the fourth step S stands for shifting your state. When we compare ourselves to others, we feel gross. It feels disgusting. I don't know if you have ever had a half an hour scroll session. <laughs> I always walk away feeling gross. And so one of the best things that you can do is shift your state, get up, dance, jump around, put Beyonce on, do some star jumps, jump on the trampoline, dive in the ocean, splash your face with water, put some oils on your body, just do anything to upgrade your energy in that moment. For me, even just shaking my body, dancing or going for a swim or going out into nature instantly shifts my state. So that is the four-step ACEs technique that'll help you feel ACE again. And I'll just reiterate it. It's um, A stands for awareness. C, choose a different path. E, eliminate, exit or exhale. And um, S, shifting your state. So that is what I do anytime I find myself comparing myself to anyone else in any area of my life. And it works. And it's not about just thinking positive and going, oh, that's great that they have that and I can have it too. Like we've got to work through it. You know, we've got to really dig deep and remove the blocks that are within us. Um, and this technique really has helped me and it's helped so many people now that the book's out and my clients as well. I love that. And I, I agree. It's about processing why you're getting triggered, which is, you know, the first two steps is really looking at it and, and choosing to see it differently. And I really love step E because I think that, you know, like we were talking about before, 
I really think it's like mental health care. And it's important that we, we can honor ourselves in those moments and give ourselves, like you said, even if it's like, I think you say in the book, like you don't have to tell anybody why you're going to the bathroom. You have to just go to the bathroom. No one needs to know. Not to be like, oh, everyone's talking about their new raises. So I'm going to go throw up in the bathroom. <laughs> no, it's like, no, I just have to pee. <laughs> no one needs to know. And you just go in there and you just sit with yourself and you have, that gives you that moment to actually be like, okay, why am I feeling triggered right now? I'm feeling triggered mm -hmm. because I really have been manifesting that new raise and everyone's talking about their money or whatever. And mm -hmm. I think that's those moments are the moments where we get to be our best friend, mm -hmm. right? Because as much as we all have best friends and amazing partners, you are your best friend. Like you, it's you and you in this lifetime, right? Mm -hmm. And in those moments where we allow ourselves to hold our heart, you know, and to allow ourselves those tender moments. And for anyone, you know, I love that you said that. This is, it's not spiritual bypassing, it's mental health care. And in those moments, especially if someone is feeling extremely anxious or depressed or, you know, in a spiral of comparison, just get off Instagram for a week. Just get it's it off. You don't need to like win. Don't try to win some award by pushing through. Give you, like you said, give yourself that, give that wound some time to heal. Let yourself recenter, let yourself ground. And then when you enter it, again, you can enter it a little bit more consciously. And there's, you know, as far as the Instagram stuff goes, or even the friend stuff, like it's okay to eliminate things from your life that consistently don't make you feel good. So if there's someone that you've tried to go through the whole thing with and, you know, just some mythical figure online or whatever, and you're like, I just can't shift it every time I see her, she makes me feel like crap about myself or my body or, or my life or whatever it is in some way it's not her fault. You know, we're not making her a bad person, but there's also nothing wrong with you unfollowing that person right now. Right. If that's what's in your highest mental good. A thousand percent. It's essential that we set healthy boundaries for ourselves. And that includes healthy boundaries with social media. It's very important. There's a whole chapter in my book on social media, mm -hmm. an entire chapter dedicated to it. I know for me, I really do well when I set healthy boundaries uh, in every area of my life with my relationships, with work, and especially with social media. So there's a couple of things that you can do, and I'll, I'll share a few of them from the chapter. Uh, one of them is taking uh, doing a social media detox, you know, it's really important to do that. I take m almost every Sunday completely off social media and it feels so good. It feels really, really good. And sometimes Saturdays I'll do the whole weekend off as well. And it's amazing. I just love it so much. And uh, I also, another thing that I do is I set a time limit. I've got an app limit for Instagram. And you can do it for each app if you want to. Um, I don't have Facebook on my phone. I don't have Twitter on my phone. Um, so I don't uh, need to put limits for those. But for me, uh, Instagram is my, my, my app that I use most. And so I give myself a time limit and then it locks me out of it. And, you know, I'm done for the day. Done. That's it. There's no more going back in. And that works really well for me because I share in the book uh, that on average, we spend six years of our life on social media. Oh my gosh. Six? Isn't that terrifying? <laughs> that, okay. So when I was researching the book and I discovered that, I asked myself, am I happy with that? Do I want to be that statistic? And the answer was a big no, I do not want to be that statistic. And so I made a conscious effort to put the app limit on my phone and to honor that. And it feels really good in my body. And, you know, now having a newborn baby, I do not go on my phone in front of her. 
Uh, that's a huge thing for me. I don't even want her to see me pick up my phone. Uh, my phone is when she is awake, my phone is out of sight. It's, it's not in her, in the room where we are or in the lounge room, it's away from her. It's always on airplane mode. Um, and then I do whatever I need to do on my phone when she's asleep out of her sight. I don't want her to see me working on this thing and for her to think what is mommy playing with that's more important than me why mm. is mommy doing that that is that more important than me no I don't want her to think that so we've set some healthy boundaries and my husband as well and he thinks it's amazing and he honors them as well which is really great um you know and when we have people over uh you know we we you know encourage them as well we're like oh would you mind you know popping your phone on silent or um, just popping it out of eyesight. I just don't want her to see them. Um, she's going to get exposed to them, of course, but as much as I can in our home, I, I really want to minimize the exposure. And uh, just for me, those, those healthy boundaries around my phone and around social media have helped me so much. I cannot tell you how much it's helped me and my mental health. Oh my gosh. And just even what you're saying about how you're doing it around your daughter, just thinking about how that, for those who don't have children, you make that influence on your family, on your partners, on your friends. Like if you go out to a lunch and, you know, both of us are on social media. We have like a social media business or whatever, right? Part of our business. Um, and, you know, if there is something, if we're going to, if I'm like going out with someone else that also want, is going to Instagram something, you know, we make it a thing to be like, let's just do the, like, let's just get it over with at the beginning and then hide our phones, right? 100%. Or we don't do it at all because you don't always need to do it, right? But sometimes or whatever, if you want to do it, it's fine if the, whatever, but it's like having that clear thing. So it's like, okay, we're going to do that. We're going to go away. Like a big thing when I was dating my fiance was realizing that, you know, I'm not going to be Instagramming our dates or the food, you know, like maybe if there's like some super special occasion or something for whatever reason, but in general, no, that's like not a thing. I'm not on the phone. And I think that also just has us be more present to who's in front of us. And we can be, everyone's an influencer in that way, right? If you go out to lunch and you don't look at your phone once, I guarantee you, if your friend does, she's going to feel a little like, she's going to make it quick because mm -hmm. she's going to notice, right? And if, you know, another fun test I love is like, if someone goes to the bathroom and you're by yourself, can you just sit there by yourself? And not go on your phone. It's the craziest challenge. So <laughs> I love that. That's a good challenge for everyone listening. I think, you know, next time you are out <laughs> somewhere, just sit with yourself. And uh, yeah, I talk about as well in the book, do more things that make you forget to look at your phone. Do more things that make you forget to look at your phone. So that you know, inject those things into your life. I think when we're constantly thinking and looking at our phone, we need to kind of ask ourselves, well, why am I doing that? So do more things that make you forget to even look at your phone. And my girlfriends and I are the same. We have the most epic picnics uh, where I live. And um, for those that follow me on social media, I get so many messages about my picnics with my girlfriends. You know, we have like the most beautiful cushions and uh, rugs and we live in a beautiful uh, climate and our, our beautiful organic plant-based feasts are amazing and so Instagram worthy. And we get people uh, commenting and sending lots of DMs about it. And so when we catch up, we literally, you know, we'll display all the food and because we love beauty and we'll all, you know, do a little video and then our phones are on silent or on airplane mode and they're out of sight. None of us are on our phones. We are so present with each other um, for the next, you know, three or four hours, however long it is. And um, yeah, we're just there. And I think that's a really beautiful thing to do. And, you know, whenever we go to dinners or lunches or have people over, um, 
most of our friends don't do this, but if they ever do um, put their phone on the table, I'll say to them, is it okay if I just pop your phone over on over here whilst we eat dinner like I, I don't want to see a phone whilst I'm having dinner and for me it's I an energy it. it's an energetic thing like I look at my phone and it's an energetic thing you know it's got a different energy to say looking at a crystal you feel different you look at your phone you feel different to looking at a crystal and so for me having my phone out of sight as much as possible, putting it in a drawer. My phone is always on silent and most of the time it's on airplane mode. And, you know, when I first had my baby, I was using my phone a lot because I was uh, making note of when I was breastfeeding um, and how long I was breastfeeding for and which breast I was breastfeeding off and, (laughs) you know, things like that. And I realized like, I was like, my phone I'm carrying my phone and my baby everywhere. And that felt really gross for me. And so I asked my dad, I was like, dad, do you have an old watch? <laughs> like, I just need to know the time and I need to know roughly how long I've I've been sitting breastfeeding for. And he just gave me like this old school um, watch, like that was on a pendant really. And he said, yeah, I found this. And I was like, great, can I have that? So that just sits next to me in my breastfeeding chair now. And I don't even need to take my phone into her room while I'm breastfeeding. And it's just little things like that. And people say to me, yeah, but I use my alarm in the morning for my phone in my bedroom. I'm like, get an alarm clock, like get a battery operated alarm clock, Uh, get the phone out of your bedroom get it out of your bedroom. Like we, yeah, that's a big one, another big one for us. And uh, it's just these little things that you can do, these little healthy habits that really make such a difference to your mental health. And yeah, like I said before, just do more things that make you forget to even look at your phone. Absolutely. I love that. And I feel like for me too, it's like a sense of freedom. I was like using all these product productivity apps or whatnot and like lists and stuff on my phone. And recently I just went back, I just used old fashioned scrap paper, you know, like I use like the backside of, you know, old mail or stuff, you know, and whatnot. And I love it. Like I love just writing out the list and having it because then the phone can be someplace else charging or whatever. And there is a feeling of freedom when your phone's not around you. And if it's there, so many of us, I have already have like programmed the compulsion to constantly be checking it. So you can help yourself out in that way by having it out of sight. You know, if you're in your office, then put it someplace else, right? You can like, if you, if you might have an emergency call or whatever, you can check it like every couple hours and whatever, and it's fine. Um, I want to touch on relationships and body. So I want to hear maybe your quick, like a, a, what you think, you know, maybe a little word to anyone that's comparing with relationships. I certainly have thoughts on this one. Um, and we'll start with there. What would you say to someone that's like really ready for either really ready to call on their partner or maybe they're with someone that they think is really great in a good relationship but constantly comparing to everybody on social media and wondering like, is this as good as it gets? Because all these people look like they have these like magical, mystical relationships. (laughs) No such thing. No (laughs) such thing as a magical, mystical relationship. No such thing. thing. And who Um, would want it? It's so juicy to do all the work. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think oh my goodness, like I love this topic so much. And I wrote a whole book on it, Open Wide, uh, a radically real guide to deep love, rocking relationships and soulful sex. If you want to dive deeper into relationships, go and read that book. But let's talk about how it um, relates to comparing ourselves with, you know, especially online or friendships. It, it comes back to, you know, what I would say if you are currently not in a relationship and you are looking at other people and you are looking at their soulmate relationship and thinking, I want that. What I would do first is I would get clear on what it is that you see that you desire. Like, what is it? Is it, is it that they have similar interests? Is it that they, the way that they listen to each other? What is it specifically about that couple 
that you truly desire within you, write it down and then ask yourself, what is my block to having that? So what is my block? Like, why, why do I feel that I, why do I feel like I don't have that? And, you know, you might go digging deep and you might realize that there's a part of you that doesn't feel worthy of it you know, doesn't feel worthy. Maybe, you know, you witnessed your something within your parents' relationship, which is playing out in your current situation. So go digging deep. And I think the more internal work that you can do on yourself, the better. And it's, it's not like you have to do all of this internal work and be perfect, quote unquote, perfect. There's no such thing. But there is a level of awareness that we need to have. And the more internal work we can do before we meet our soulmate, the better. And hopefully that person has done a lot of internal work too. And because when two conscious people come together, it's just fireworks. That doesn't mean that you stop working. Like my husband and I have been together eight years next month and we have gone through iterations and upgrades in our relationship over the last eight years and it gets better and better because we're both deeply committed to the work and doing the work and moving through things together and on our own and it really is such a beautiful thing so for anyone who is comparing go and write out what it is that you see in that other relationship that you truly desire, work on removing the blocks that are there and then uh, taking inspired action, doing some of your meditations, uh, doing some of your uh, manifesting meditations. And I think the, the deepest thing is knowing that you are truly worthy of it knowing that you're truly worthy of that divine relationship because that is usually the biggest block. I have a gorgeous friend who is, I'm not even joking, she's an ex-model. She is stunning. She is so intelligent. She is kind. She is compassionate. She's like she does all this um work with, uh, she does all this um, philanthropy work, you know, she's just incredible, right? And she's single. And she said to me, she's like, you know, there's a part of me that doesn't feel worthy of it. That's her block. And that's because she witnessed her parents and, and stuff unfolding with her parents' relationship. And she doesn't feel worthy of a divine relationship. And I said, babe, that's, that's where you've got to go. That's where you've got to unpack that. And she's working on it now. And and I do feel like it's going to definitely happen soon. Uh, But know that you are worthy of that divine relationship and really feel that. Knowing and feeling are two different things. Knowing that you're worthy, but then feeling it with every cell in your body is the next level. I feel like And I've witnessed with my friends and clients when they truly get to that place of knowing and feeling how worthy they are, then the relationship just like magic pops up. Oh, things go so much faster. And all of a sudden, even when you're dating, when it doesn't work out, you don't even take it personally. You're like, next, you know, (laughs) and it's like you're. Yeah, it just totally changes your energy. And you're right, there is actually a meditation on worthiness in the romantic relationship chapter for manifesting through meditation because it's huge. It's the hu- hugest thing. I think even in my relationship, when I attracted, um, I did a ton of work um, you know, on myself before I manifested my partner. And I remember even like in the journey of our relationship while we were already together, there were even more levels of worthiness that I had to unlock to fully receive how amazing he was and to fully like receive that. Like I like this gets to be my life. I get, I get to do this. I get to have a partner that loves me and, and treats me this way. And we have these conversations, like, you know, all the amazing things. And so, you know, uh, there's no shame in having that block. I think oh, so many of us, got some sort of messaging in childhood some way (laughs) around something right and showing up to that work and then 
And then again, once you come to that, when you have that space of worthiness within you, and then you're scrolling through social media or whatever, it's, uh, or you see your friends and their relationship, it's easier because you're like, oh, I can't wait for mine to come, right? Mm -hmm. Because he's going to be, or she's going to be, or whoever's going to be amazing, right? Mm -hmm. So I love that. Yeah. And the other aspect I just want to throw into that is that, oh my gosh, social media is such a small slice of the cake when it comes to relationships. Nobody could even post. Like I think the difficult slash beautiful moments of my relationship where we've had those, you know, 3 a.m. conversations where both of our hearts are like on the floor and we're like, this is what matters to me and this is what matters to me and like, let's hash it out and let's figure it out. Like those never make social media you know it's the highlight reel because we're in it you know because we're doing the thing you know no one's posting it social media when their partner's driving them insane because they forgot the laundry for the seventh time this week you know and they're just like can you just get the laundry or whatever it is (laughs) like nobody's posting that why just because who thinks to post that kind of thing you're in the moment but you're in the moment. And so, you know, it's just realizing that relationships, just like friendships, you can think about it like friendships too. Friendships are so multidimensional. There's no way you could post a picture best friend and fully encapsulate the entirety of your friendship. Romantic relationships are no different. So just know that that is exactly what it is. It's just a picture and it's a moment and it's something that they want to celebrate. And of course, but that doesn't mean that they don't go through the whole ups and downs and and highs and lows. A thousand percent. And remember that social media is the highlight reel. It's, I mean, we have highlights. They're called highlights. (laughs) Like- They made it so easy for us. They made it so easy. Yet- our yet at many, 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 many times, our inner mean girl tells us that, no, that's not the highlight, that's reality. Like she tries to trick us to tell us that it's it's not and that and and to make us forget. But we have to remember this is the highlight reel. No one is posting when they're you know, kid is vomiting and, you know, like no one's, or when the whole family's got gastro and, yeah. you know, no one's posting that stuff. And so remember that. And I have to remind myself of that too. Yeah. This is the highlight reel. This is the highlight reel. This is, this is not the totality. This is not the entire picture here. So we need to remember that literally, if you, you know, put it on your computer or put it on your phone as a, as a screensaver and remind yourself if you need to, um, because it's so important that we remember that. Yes, for sure. Okay. So last topic, the body, what do you say to someone who is struggling with body comparison? Again, come back to what we said at the start, what is it that you're comparing? What is it? Is it their strength? Is it their glowing skin? Is it their energy? Is it the way that they can pull their leg over their head in yoga? Like what is it exactly? And then use that as inspiration to propel you forward toward your desires. So that is really an important thing that we need to do is get clear on what it is and then, uh, use it as motivation and inspiration in a healthy way. Take yourself through that ACEs technique as well. And uh, don't let it spiral you into toxic comparisonitis. And how do we know when to, when we shouldn't maybe be using it for inspiration, right? Like both me and you have been, um, you know, dancers and in the arts and stuff like that. And even before social media existed, and I was thinking about that when I was reading your book, because I too was in a very similar situation where, you know, I was auditioning and people are constantly judging your bodies when you're a dancer, you're an actress. And this was pre-Instagram and Facebook, (laughs) believe it or not. It, it, that was a time guys. Um, (laughs) and that, still very much exists and now I it like exists on crack now thanks to Instagram but there were moments where I think you know by let's say a 
I don't know, a balanced judge of sorts, <laughs> quote unquote, one would be like, Melissa, you don't need to look like whoever so-and-so ballerina number five that they're saying is has a perfect body, right? Because how do you know kind of to be that discernment of being like, oh, well, it's great. Like, I like, you know, so-and-so is doing this awesome yoga pose it, or I love like the tone it up girls and how like strong and fun and their like playful energy is about fitness versus you kind of trying to put your body into a space that's not meant for it. It comes back to a deep sense of self love and respect and what we were talking about before worthiness at the core of everything is self-love when we so so instead of looking at these people and going oh okay I want the abs or I want the flexibility or I want the energy you seeing it as inspiration motivation and then coming back to and I love myself so much I love my my body. I'm so grateful. I love my body. I'm so grateful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I love how clear her skin is. I wonder what she eats. Like, yeah, I'm really curious, like almost looking at it with a curiosity or I love myself so much and she is so flexible. I really want to you know what? I'm going to get back into going to yoga. I really would love to be able to do a handstand and bend my leg back like that too. I just think that would be so awesome and such a cool party trick. It's something that I want to do um, or, or I want to run that marathon or whatever it is. But it's coming from that place of self-love as opposed to self-loathing. Self-loathing is I see that other person with the abs or the skin or the energy and I can't have that and I'm not good enough and I'll never have that, that lack mentality that is uh, self-loathing. And then coming from a deep place of self-love is, yeah, I, I love her energy or her skin or her abs. Um, I love myself too, um, but I'm going to use that as inspo to get back to the gym or to get back to yoga classes. So the real question is, do I love myself? You know, mm -hmm. how much? How much do I love myself? How much do I need to go and dial up my self-love? And that is what we really need to look at. We need to go there. And that's not always comfortable. And it's not always easy to have a conversation with ourselves and say, well, okay, it, where, do I, where do I feel like if self-love if, if I'm on a scale and, and I, I love myself as a 10 and I loathe myself as a, as a zero, where do I sit right now? Where do I feel I am on the scale? And be really honest with yourself. And if the answer is three or four or five or six or one or whatever, what do you need to do to get to that 10 where you are overflowing with love within yourself? What do you need to do? What blocks do you need to remove? What inner work do you need to do? Um, maybe there's some inner child healing stuff that needs to be done. This is where coaches and therapists and uh, counselors can be really powerful, supportive mirrors for you to have a little conversation with and unpack it and, and move forward so that you feel like a 10 out of 10 on the self-love scale, that's where we really need to go. And I think about, imagine a world where we all felt like 10 out of 10, like overflowing with self-love. Imagine we would, we would be so much more kind to each other. We would live in such a different world. And I think uh, we need to get, we need to work on our self-love. That's, that's where we need to go. Yeah, I love that. And you talk about that in the book, you talk about really tuning into the things that you love about your body, which I also um, really second, you know, I also have a book called Eat With Int Intention, which was about my journey with loving my body and, and all of that. And I think you hit it on it in comparisonitis in the body section where you talk about finding those things you can find the gratitude about in your body. 
right? Like being grateful that your eyes can see, or if you like your hair or, you know, just like that you can dance with your legs, you know? Um, and I call, I call that like authentic gratitude. And sometimes, especially around our body, you know, if they, we all have an area, maybe that we don't love as much as another area that's a pro, quote unquote problem area as um, we've felt over the years or something, right? Something we're more self-conscious about. And when you're beginning your journey, don't try to, don't try to force yourself to love that area right away, but you can love your body as a whole mm -hmm. and that area will receive that love, right? Mm -hmm. You can love like the energy you have or the way that you're able to dance with your kids or hug your partner and, and all of these things. And, um, I also do have a meditation for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, All the so, ones. <laughs> oh, but yeah. it's so important. It's so important because, and then I also think, you know, this area while you're doing that deep self-love work, this is an area where you get to do the E, <laughs> right? And if there are certain things that you need to avoid to keep your mind in a beautiful space during that, and there are certain people that, you know, it's like, you're not, you're still working on that self-love muscle and that person is not facilitating that work. <laughs> it's okay. Um, there's mm -hmm. nothing wrong if you need to, you know, for me on that journey, back, back in the day before Instagram, that was <laughs> like, I, I went on like a magazine hiatus, mm. you know, I stopped looking at magazines because that was one of the things that would, was comparisonitis before Instagram existed. Yes. And <laughs> I think it's, I think it's really important as well, what you said, and I talk about this in all of my books, that self-love is a muscle and the more you strengthen it, the stronger it's going to get. It's like the more you do squats, the tighter your butt is going to get. The more you flex your self-love muscle, the stronger it's going to get. And just this morning, so uh, my husband was on a call this morning. He usually, um, watches our daughter if I'm having a shower, but I just put her in her little bouncer and I brought her into the shower, uh, to the bathroom with me. And I was chatting to her about what I was doing and washing, you know, under my arms and all these things. And we just have a chat. Um, and she just watches mama. And then when I got out of the shower, I was drying myself and, um, I have this beautiful Ayurvedic Abhyanga body oil. And so I put a little bit in my hand and I said, um, the, I'm, I'm going to, you know, it was going to moisturize my body. And so I started at my feet and as I'm doing it, she's watching me. She's, she's a newborn baby. And I'm saying, thank you legs. I love you. You're so strong legs. Thank you for carrying me through the day. And I'm so grateful for you. Thank you. I love you legs. And then I got to my belly and I was like, thank you belly. I love you. And thank you breasts for providing milk for my beautiful daughter. Like I want her to be programmed with that stuff um so I do that most mornings when she's in there if she's in there with me watching me I want her to see a mama who is confident in her body and who loves her body because I haven't always and I think it's such an important thing that we embody within ourselves because what we embody we teach our children Absolutely. And I think that that's a really powerful self-love ritual, regardless of if you have a little one in there watching you. I think it's amazing to be doing that with your little daughter. But yeah. even, you know, when you're um, by yourself, one of, you know, something I think is great is even when you're, whether you're washing or you're shaving or you're moisturizing, taking that moment to just have some gratitude for every inch of your body and just thank you to like just thank you for all like working and being alive and you know it's so amazing and and it is you know we we send that message to everyone in our life right yeah. and um you know I have a stepdaughter and she's 10 and she's going through you know the ch -ch changes mm -hmm. and, and you know I was so proud of myself the other day because my fiance told me, he was like, you know what she asked me the other day? She was like, why is Cassandra 
so like so comfortable in her body. She doesn't care what anyone thinks. And <laughs> And I was like, mission accomplished. Yeah. And, you know, of course we all know we're human, right? But it is like having someone else around, right? That you know is like impressionable eyes, I think is such a gift, right? It's so, you know, important to me that she gets that message, right? That for me, whether it's like, you know, I'm wearing my pajamas or whatever, making breakfast and something like that. Like I like, and my hair will be crazy. You know, I look like I just woke up or whatnot. And, you know, you know, my fiance will maybe joke about something and I'll be like, I'm a beautiful goddess. Mm -hmm. And, (laughs) and she like, and which they soak, they soak it up, right. They soak it up. And, you know, and because I think, you know, I hope that one day when she's making breakfast and like a t-shirt and shorts and I'm kind of looking like a mess that she too can be like, I'm a beautiful goddess. You know? <laughs> you know, we get to give that gift. And, and right now, even if you don't have a daughter or a little lady eyes around you, you know, you get to give that gift to your younger self, right? Because mm. so many of us didn't have that experience growing up and we didn't learn that but we get to teach ourselves and we get to mother our inner little girl that still needs that reminder that she is a goddess and she's beautiful regardless of how she looks absolutely and our sons too not just the girls absolutely the men i think the men the men need it so much as well and and we don't talk about it as much, but, but being, being that comfortable role model and being someone that's happy about their body and happy and looking to be healthy and improve it and do all that at the same time. is just so important. Ah, Melissa, this has been Mm -hmm. such a pleasure. I don't want to steal any more time away from your darling little daughter, (laughs) but if you have any last parting remarks you want to share, um, with anyone before we go and then let us know how everyone can find you. And of course, there'll be all the links below so you can get your hands on comparisonitis and, and all of Melissa's stuff. Mm, thank you, hon. I just want to remind everyone that they are a miracle. There was one in 400 trillion chances that you were born. One in 400 trillion that your parents sperm and egg came together and created you and you came through the portal. Like if that's not a freaking miracle, I don't know what is. And I want to remind you of that. You are a miracle. You matter. Like you're here on earth at this time in this time, space and reality. And that means that you have something to share. You matter. You are unique And please don't let your inner critic hold you back and tell you that you're not worthy and that you're not good enough or smart enough or you can't write the book or or do the podcast or whatever it is because you can. You absolutely can. Don't compare yourself to anyone else. Get clear on what it is that you want and then take inspired action to make it happen. Amen to that. Ah, (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. And I'll, oh, oh, sorry, I was just going to say, and yeah, come and check out the book and my podcast. It's called The Melissa Ambrosini Show. Super easy to remember. And uh, come and tell me on Instagram at Melissa Ambrosini what you got out of this episode. I absolutely would love to hear what you got out of it and check out my website, melissaambrosini.com. And I've also had the beautiful Cassandra on my podcast. So go and listen to that episode. It's all about how to manifest anything you want in your life. And it's such a great episode. So go and check that out. And thank you so much for having me, honey. I've really loved this conversation. Of course, this has been amazing. Yes, I love that we got to do a double feature. So you can double down on both of us. Um, And this was just a delight to connect with you. And thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with the world. It so, so needs it. Mm, Thank you, honey.